Tonight, all the day's major developing stories here on Prime. The Israel-Hamas war in Gaza enters its 18th day and the bloodshed has not relented. Tonight, new details on the just-released Israeli hostages' captivity. And we'll look at the impact on millions in Gaza with just 24 hours of fuel left before supplies run out. Plus, just four hours after winning the Republican speaker nomination, Congressman Tom Emmer is out of the race. The congressional chaos back at square one and where we could possibly go from here. And he was Donald Trump's own chief of staff. Now he could be the one to bring the former president down. The late breaking news around Mark Meadows and why he could put Trump in legal jeopardy. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin with the Israel-Hamas war and the intense negotiations that we've now learned about to free a large number of hostages being held by Hamas. This comes as Israel prepares for a ground invasion of Gaza. But with those roughly 220 hostages at risk, the families of those missing and the U.S. are pressuring Israel to delay any incursion. Thousands of Israeli troops are standing by at the border just waiting for word to go in. And Israel has continued to barred Gaza in response to Hamas's brutal terror attack. Much needed aid is slowly beginning to trickle in. Today, 20 additional aid trucks crossed Egypt's Rafah border. That brings the total to at least 74 over the last four days. Four hostages have been released so far, including an 85-year-old who was freed yesterday who described her ordeal saying simply, I've been through hell. And we are standing by to talk with a loved one whose sister is believed to be among the hostages still being held by Hamas. But first, our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, leads us off once again from Tel Aviv. Tonight, ABC News has learned of intense negotiations to free a large number of hostages involving the U.S., Israel, Qatar, and Egypt, head of an expected ground invasion in Gaza. Hamas still holding about 220 hostages, including Americans. Israel facing pressure from the U.S. government and Israeli families to delay any invasion to give negotiators more time. Is there an effort being made to avoid hitting the areas where they might be? Their presence is obviously influencing our operational activities. That pressure intensifying today, 24 hours after these images. Two Israeli seniors released by Hamas, 85-year-old Yohevet Lifshitz and 79-year-old Nurit Cooper, loaded into those ambulances in Egypt, airlifted to Israel. Today, Lifshitz describing living through hell, sitting in her wheelchair, frail, her voice faint. Her daughter Sharon translating, describing the moment Hamas terrorists stormed her kibbutz and kidnapped Lifshitz and her husband. She was taken on the back of a motorbike with her body, uh, with her legs on one side and her head on another side. While she was do being taken, she was hit by uh, sticks. We have reported here on the vast network of tunnels Hamas has built under the Gaza Strip, and Lifshitz describing being taken into those tunnels with the other captives. There are a huge, um, huge um, network of tunnels underneath. It looks like a spider web. The lifelong peace activist who helped Palestinian civilians in the past getting them medical care in Israel, describing how Hamas kidnappers took her jewelry, her watch, but she says they fed her bread, cheese and cucumbers, even gave her medicine, describing the ground as moist, the air humid. Lifshitz also critical of the Israeli government, saying they didn't take warning signs seriously. And all day today, Israel launching one of the most intense aerial attacks on Gaza. Over 400 airstrikes in the past 24 hours. Gaza's hospital system on the brink of collapse. The WHO saying an estimated 5,500 pregnant women in Gaza expected to give birth in the next month. But a UN agency says emergency delivery kits with step-by-step -step instructions guiding women through their deliveries have yet to arrive. Containing plastic bags and scissors to cut the umbilical cord. Officials saying at least six hospitals running out of fuel today, jeopardizing life-saving health care equipment for babies. We've just run out of almost everything. Yesterday, a lot of the times, we had very little electricity. Um, and the killing continues. Just across the border in Israel, we witnessed the IDF's military buildup, mobilizing for that possible ground attack. This is a massive brigade assembly site. You can see armor, 
starting to prepare and maneuver. And just on the other side over there, behind those armored personnel carriers, Israeli troops are preparing for combat. They say they're getting closer and closer to moving into Gaza here. A commander there telling us the fighting expected to be brutal and long. It's one of the most complicated urban area warfare you can think about because you have uh, the above ground, you have uh, Hamas and drones, Hamas have uh, grenades, uh, and uh, grenades that falls up on the sky. Yeah, super complicated there. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman joins us now. Matt, what more did those 85-year-old hostage say about her conversations with her captors? It was incredible video, Lindsay. As she was being released by those captors, she actually made an effort, turned around to shake the captor's hand, and she said to him, shalom, shalom. And that could be goodbye, but shalom, of course, also means peace. She says that they treated them relatively well. There was enough food to eat. There was medicine in there in those tunnels where they were being held. But again, she called it a living nightmare. Lindsay. Mm. And also, tell us the latest about that horrific hospital explosion in Gaza. It happened last week, and the U.S. intelligence community late today now saying they believe it was an errant Palestinian rocket that hit that hospital compound, not an Israeli missile. They also say they believe the death toll is likely far lower than initially reported. Lindsay. All right, Matt Gutman reporting once again from Tel Aviv for us. Thanks so much, Matt. We're learning more about those attacks on U.S. targets in the Middle East last week. With 13 attacks on U.S. targets and two dozen U.S. troops injured, the U.S. says it believes Iran is helping to fund those attacks. Secretary of State Antony Blinken had a clear message for Iran at the U.N. today. Take a listen. The United States does not seek conflict with Iran. We do not want this war to widen. But if Iran or its proxies attack U.S. personnel anywhere, make no mistake. We will defend our people, we will defend our security, swiftly and decisively. ABC's Chief Global Affairs anchor Martha Raddatz joins us now. Uh, Martha, what's the U.S. doing to respond to this threat from Iran in the Mideast? Lindsay, the U.S. is rushing additional warships, fighter jets, and missile defense systems to the region in case this war widens. Already in the past eight days, the Pentagon says Iranian-backed proxies have launched attacks on American troops in Iraq and Syria more than a dozen times, as you said. And as you mentioned, those attacks injured 24 U.S. troops. Thankfully, those injuries were all minor. But a U.S. official telling me the Pentagon is now weighing military options against those proxy forces. The Pentagon also preparing for the possible evacuation of U.S. citizens from Israel and the Middle East. There are hundreds of thousands of Americans living in the region. Lindsay? Mm. All right. Martha Raddatz for us. Our thanks to you, Martha. We are joined now by Leon Yanai, whose sister Marun is missing. Uh, last seen in video being captured by Hamas from that music festival in southern Israel. Thank you so much for joining us. And of course, our, our sympathies go out to, to you and your family. Uh, we know that you have not Thank received you. any official confirmation on your sister's whereabouts since she was captured. If you can just describe those last communications that your family had with her during the attack and, and what your family has been facing these last two weeks. Well, uh... Since the attack, the, my 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 sister, my baby sister, Moran, managed to call my uh, my parents on the day of the attack. Uh, last call was uh, about uh, half past eight in the morning. Uh, she called my mother and uh, told her that they are being shot at there, that, that they are on the run, and that she's losing her battery. That was the last time that uh, uh, we got a call from Moran. And later on, we find out that uh, Moran continued running away with uh, her friends. And uh, they've been ambushed on their way. Finally, they had to split up. And uh, that's the last location that we know where Moran was. Uh, we wanted to look for more information, so we scanned the internet and the social networks. And uh, we found the clip uh, which so shows that uh, Moran was kidnapped. That's the last evidence that we had. Uh, it's already been 17, 18 days since. It, what did that video show uh, of your sister? It shows her uh, in the sands, uh, like she's on the ground and there's some attackers above her, uh, speaking in Arabic, uh, cursing her, and uh, telling, and, and looking for things to do. And she's begging for her life there. 
that's it. That's the last uh, thing that we know. That's the last script that we, that we found that shows Moran. And uh, speak for yourself. Yeah, we don't know anymore. Uh, we try to scan more on the internet. We try everything, but uh, no more information. What has it been like for you and, and your parents in recent days as we've now seen some hostages who are being freed? Has it, has it changed your outlook on your sister's prospects of potentially getting out safely? Well, I'm happy for these people that got uh, freed. Uh, it's very hard for them as well. I hope it doesn't uh, do something where it's, it's hold back the release of my sister. Uh, I still believe that she'll be released. I still believe that uh, things are being done. And uh, I especially believe that I still need to keep on asking people to, for the community, for the international community to come and help us to free these uh, people. After all, my sister just went to a, a peaceful music festival, a festival to show all about music, peace and love. So I'm not sad, but I still believe that she will come, and I hope that the other authorities doing everything they can to help us bring them back. Your sister is a jewelry designer. Uh, one of your relatives called her, quote, the softest soul. Uh, tell us more about, about your sister and, and what makes her special. Uh, she's a beautiful person a very peaceful uh, person. She always uh, spread a positive atmosphere around her. She loves people. She loves animals. Uh, she was working in the in animal rescue, saving many lives of animals as a volunteer. She's an artist. She writes songs. Uh, she's doing some paintings. Lately, she's, she was doing a new line of jewelry she's designed. Uh, she was very excited about her. She's a very, she has lots of friends who loves her. She loves everyone. She wants to do help, to help all, all people, never, nevertheless uh, who they are. And she's truly a great person. What's your message to your sister if, if she can hear you right now? I would say to my sister, uh, be strong. Continue to be positive as you are. Uh, think about the big hugs we're all going to give you when you come back. And I want you to know that we're doing everything we can to bring you back home. Leon and I, we thank you again for your time tonight, and, and we certainly will keep you and, and your family in our thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now to an ABC News exclusive and news that former President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, was granted immunity to testify in the federal election interference case against Trump. Sources familiar with the matter say Meadows has already spoken with special counsel Jack Smith's team at least three times, testifying that he warned Trump there was no evidence to prove election fraud in 2020. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. In a striking break with the former president, Mark Meadows, the former White House chief of staff, long seen as one of Donald Trump's closest and most loyal advisors, has testified before the federal grand jury investigating election interference in exchange for immunity, according to sources familiar with what Meadows has told special counsel Jack Smith's team. Those sources tell ABC News Meadows told prosecutors Trump was being dishonest when he said this on election night in 2020 before all the votes were in. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. But according to sources, Meadows told prosecutors, obviously we didn't win. In fact, he said that he agrees with the Department of Homeland Security's assessment that the 2020 election was the most secure election in American history. It's quite an about face for Meadows. He was by Trump's side as he tried to overturn the election, including setting up that phone call where Trump urged Georgia's Secretary of State to, quote, find 11,780 votes. Mr. President, everybody is on the line, and just so this is Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. Meadows was standing backstage with Trump and his family at the January 6th rally outside the White House. Mark Meadows, an actual fighter. <laughs> but sources tell us Meadows testified that in the weeks after the election, he repeatedly told Trump the allegations of significant fraud were turning out to be baseless. There were simply no evidence. Meadows also said he thought of resigning many times himself, those sources say, but he stayed on because he wanted to help ensure a peaceful transition to a Biden administration. This comes on a day of drama and tears in a Georgia courtroom, 
as another close Trump ally pleads guilty in that state's election interference case. State versus uh, Jenna Ellis. Lawyer Jenna Ellis, who promoted Trump's election lies, today says she regrets it all. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. Ellis is now pledging to cooperate with prosecutors in their case against Donald Trump. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl. And joining us now for more is John Santucci, an ABC News contributor and lawyer, Kim Whaley. Thank you both so much for your time tonight. John, let's start with you. Uh, what are your sources telling you in the Trump world tonight? Are, are they concerned about this development and the mounting number of lawyers who are now flipping against Trump? Yeah, it's been a busy day for Donald Trump. Obviously, he was in court today on one matter, but now between our reporting from our investigative unit here at ABC News and what we saw down in Georgia today with Jenna Ellis now entering a guilty plea and cooperating with prosecutors there, it definitely is not a good day in two different jurisdictions for Donald Trump. So let's start first, Lindsay, with ABC News' reporting about Mark Meadows. Obviously, there was no one closer to Donald Trump in the final days at the White House than Mark Meadows. Mark Meadows, as John Carl's report just detailed from our team, obviously was the one that was making the phone calls, making the trips, was helping Trump at times, as he's been accused in multiple cases so far, of pushing these election lies. But in the team's reporting tonight, we are learning, Catherine Falders on our team leading the charge on this reporting from the unit, we are learning that Mark Meadows has told federal investigators that, no, wait a second, I told Donald Trump multiple times that there were issues with some of this investigating, some of these issues, some of these election rigging comments that were being made, and we were telling him not to do it. He also says, Lindsay, uh, as we learned to inveter federal investigators, a part of the special counsel's team, that, you know, the comments that Donald Trump made the night of the election, those infamous comments that, frankly, we did win this election, that's the former president, Mark Meadows told special counsel Jack Smith's team that those comments were dishonest in his opinion in hindsight. That is just a striking thing for a guy that has been so loyal to Donald Trump, wrote a book talking about how great Donald Trump was as the leader of this world, this uh, country rather. Um, but that is just an unbelievable thing that when the team first uh, started pulling this reporting together, we just couldn't believe what we had found. Striking is uh, certainly a fitting word. Uh, Kim, let's bring you in here. How significant could this be, Meadows getting immunity for special counsel Jack Smith's case overall? Well, it, it certainly suggests Jack Smith has more information than is publicly known and it, that he likely has a very, very strong case. Um, jo uh, Donald Trump also filed a flurry of motions in the January 6th uh, case this week, um, none of which is particularly strong, frankly. And so if this goes to trial, which we can expect, because I, I don't see some kind of blanket thing making it go all go away, the fact that someone this close to his inner circle who can testify as to Donald Trump's state of mind, which of course is always the, the most difficult element of a criminal prosecution, to climb inside his mind when he's saying, I believe this, and prove no, actually, he believes something else. And he can also corroborate Cassidy Hutchinson's uh, very damning testimony. And she's quite a persuasive and credible witness, whereas Mark Meadows, I think, given what he wrote in his book, which appears to be inconsistent with what he might have told the, the, the investigators here, is going to be impeachable on a number of fronts. And John, you've covered this president for quite some time. Nobody was closer to Trump during that critical period in the days before or after January 6th than Mark Meadows, mm -hmm. as, as we just heard uh, from Jonathan Carl a little while ago. How do you think that Trump is responding to all this tonight? Well, they've released a statement, Lindsay. Yet again, they attack the, the special counsel's team without evidence for leaking uh, this information. Uh, they call it very murky, and they blame uh, President Joe Biden uh, for uh, this investigation. Obviously, the current president has said he has nothing to do with this investigation. But you have to imagine a day like today for Donald Trump, it's three strikes, if you will. The Meadows reporting from our team here at ABC is unbelievable to just see it in print, that this is actually conversations that were happening in the White House. And now the, this reporting has brought that to light. Jenna Ellis, a key pillar of the Donald Trump team to overturn the 2020 election, turning on him. To see her standing in court today is just striking. And then the third one to round out this baseball game, Michael Cohen sitting in court face-to-face -face with Donald Trump today, saying that his former boss 
told him to lie, to inflate, to alter the assets that Donald Trump had. That is just three strikes and a bad Tuesday for Donald Trump, Lindsay. Yeah, we're, and we're going to get into that story next. So much uh, that we could really talk about, and we will certainly in the next uh, few days and, and weeks ahead. Thank you both so much. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Meanwhile, in New York today, former President Trump was in court face-to-face -to -face with his former attorney, Michael Cohen. In his testimony, Cohen said that he was tasked with reverse engineering Trump's financial statements to make it appear that Trump was richer than he actually was. Here's ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky. What do you expect from your Michael. testimony today? Michael Cohen once said he'd take a bullet for Donald Trump, but today he took the stand as the key witness in a case that could take down the former president's business and force him to pay $250 million. It was the first time the two men had seen each other in five years. At the reunion. In court, they sat just feet apart. Cohen hunched forward in the witness chair, Trump leaning back, arms folded across his chest, scowling. Right off the bat, Cohen acknowledged he'd served time in prison for crimes he claims he committed at the direction of, in concert with, and for the benefit of Mr. Trump. It was Cohen's testimony before Congress that led to this trial. New York Attorney General Letitia James seizing on this claim. Mr. Trump inflated his total assets when it served his purposes. Today, Cohen testified he had to reverse engineer Trump's financial statements to increase the total assets based upon a number that Trump arbitrarily elected. At one point, Cohen quoting his ex-boss saying, I am actually not worth $4.5 billion. I am really worth six. Trump, who says he did nothing wrong, attacked his fixer turned foe. He's a proven liar, as you know. He's a felon. I served a lot of time to lie. Cohen insists he's not out to settle scores. This is not about Donald Trump versus Michael Cohen or Michael Cohen versus Donald Trump. This is about accountability, plain and simple. Lindsay, we were right there in court as a lawyer for former President Trump started cross-examining Michael Cohen, gleefully recounting his criminal history and mocking him, saying, you're not on TV, you're not on a podcast. And Cohen grew combative at one point calling out objection, which a witness can't do. Trump seemed to enjoy this part of the trial, and he's expected back for more tomorrow. Lindsay? Aaron Katursky for us. Our thanks to you. Another day and still no speaker. The chaos continues on Capitol Hill. The third nominee on the GOP list dropped out just hours after getting the vote. ABC senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott is on the Hill for us again tonight. After five rounds of secret ballots, just today, Republicans nominated yet another new candidate for speaker, Republican Congressman Tom Emmer of Minnesota, the influential majority whip who spent years raising money to elect other Republicans. He drew immediate support from some moderates, but Donald Trump posted on social media voting for Emmer would be a tragic mistake, and Trump supporters in the House listened. Could you see a scenario in which you would back Emmer on the House floor? No. Tom Emmer's not a conservative. Emmer was one of only two contenders for speaker who actually voted to certify the results of the 2020 election in the hours after the attack on the Capitol. The other candidates did not. I asked him going into today if voting to certify President Biden's victory would hurt him. Is your relationship with Trump an issue? Uh, no, we, we have a good relationship. It proved to be his downfall. And today, outside of court, the former president, dealing with his own troubles, seemed very interested whether Tom Emmer was still in the running. Did he just drop out to Yeah, no, he dropped out. Well, that was Rachel Scott joins us now from the Capitol. Rachel, bottom line here, former President Trump made it quite clear he does not support Congressman Emmer, and he has subsequently bowed out. What does that say about how much power Trump still has over the party? immense power, Lindsay. We were following this in real time. Several Republicans said that they were backing Tom Emmer, and then when former President Donald Trump weighed in, they suddenly reversed course. And so now Republicans are back at square one. They are starting this process all over again, several candidates in the race, and in a stark contrast to Emmer, every single one voted to overturn the results of the 2020 election, Lindsay. Senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott reporting in from Capitol Hill. Thanks so much, Rachel. New de details tonight on the life and death struggle in the cockpit of an Alaska Airlines passenger plane. An off-duty pilot is accused of trying to bring that plane down. Court documents describe the crew as wrestling with him before he was handcuffed to a seat in the cabin. He told investigators he hadn't slept in 40 hours and thought he was dreaming. ABC's Gio Benitez has the latest. 
Tonight, Alaska Airlines pilot Joseph David Emerson looking emotional, appearing before a judge late today to face attempted murder charges right. for trying to all crash a passenger record. jet. Morning, enter not guilty plea on all counts. As we learn, he allegedly told investigators he had taken psychedelic mushrooms for the first time some 48 hours before the incident and thought he was having a nervous breakdown after going without sleep for 40 hours. Authorities say Emerson was off duty, hitching a ride in the cockpit's jump seat Sunday. The on duty pilots telling police Emerson engaged in casual conversation. But then mid flight, he threw his headset across the cockpit and announced, I am not okay. Then reaching up and grabbing the red fire handles and pulling them down. A pilot physically engaged with Emerson for 25 to 30 seconds. Had Emerson pulled the handles all the way down, the plane would have turned into a glider within seconds. The captain and the first officer prevented it, which meant they went into action immediately. Emerson calming down and exiting the cockpit, allegedly telling a flight attendant, you need to cuff me right now or it's going to be bad. Emerson, a father with an unblemished flying history, telling police he struggled with depression and a friend recently passed away. And it was his first time taking mushrooms. And Lindsay Emerson is also facing a federal charge of interfering with the flight crew along with those 83 counts of attempted murder. Lindsay. Gio, thank you. A bipartisan group of 42 attorneys general filed a lawsuit today against Meta, alleging that Facebook and Instagram are harmful to the mental health of children and teens. The lawsuit says Meta has designed its platforms to create compulsive and addictive use among young users, all in pursuit of profit. Meta says they're disappointed that attorneys general have chosen this path instead of working with companies across the industry to create standards for healthy app use. The lawsuit links Meta's algorithms and other manipulations features like frequent alerts to depression, anxiety, and lower self-esteem among young users. Still ahead tonight, body camera video shows the moment a woman is rescued after being abducted, what investigators are revealing about her experience. And our Devin Dwyer reports from South Carolina on the Supreme Court case about gerrymandering, which could reshape the political map. But next, the war between Israel and Hamas is reaching America's campaign trail. We look at how Republican candidates are using it as part of their foreign policy agendas. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California. On the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. It's been several months since the Republican presidential race kicked off, and Donald Trump remains far and away the top of the pack. But it's the infusion of foreign affairs that's taking the 2024 race into an entirely new phase. So just how will the Israel-Hamas war weigh on the minds of voters? The candidates aren't waiting to find out as they use the major issue playing out overseas to draw a line for their own campaigns. ABC's Selena Wang has more. 
As war rages in the Middle East, a war of words is erupting between Republican presidential hopefuls. Gaza. Israel. 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 Hamas. Hamas. Palestinian. Gazans and Palestinians. Flexing their foreign policy agendas in the wake of the Israel-Hamas conflict. All have staunchly defended Israel, but each fighting to pose themselves as the best alternative to GOP frontrunner Donald Trump. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said welcoming any Gazan refugees is unacceptable. The Arab nations should absorb anybody leaving Gaza. We cannot be absorbing people coming from Gaza to the United States of America. Former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley agreeing that the U.S. should not take in Gaza refugees, but pushing back on this. If you look at how they behave, not all of them are Hamas, but they are all anti-Semitic. None of them believe in Israel's right to exist. Touting her own foreign policy experience as Trump's ambassador to the United Nations. You have to realize that whether we're talking about Gazans and Palestinians, um, you know, all of them don't, you've got half of them at the time that I was there, didn't want to be under Hamas's rule. They didn't want to have terrorists overseeing them. They knew that they were living a terrible life. Still, there is one thing the candidates agree on, slamming Trump when he called Hezbollah, the Lebanese militant group, quote, very smart. You know, Hezbollah is very smart. They're all very smart. They were comments Trump would later walk back, but not before facing bipartisan criticism. Having a fool like Donald Trump who would make those comments in the tone that he made them, um, it's proven to folks that he has no business being president of the United States. The Israel-Hamas war has revealed deep fault lines among Republican presidential hopefuls over whether America should isolate or intervene in foreign affairs. Entrepreneur Vivek Ramaswamy in the past said the U.S. could phase out aid for Israel. If we ever got to the place where Israel would no longer even require aid from the U.S., which is a small portion of our budget and most of it's made in the U.S. and good for us anyway, but how good would that be for Israel? But now he is focusing on Israel having a clear objective for a ground invasion in Gaza. The condition for the U.S. funding Israel needs to be Israel having a clearly identifiable and achievable objective, both for path to victory and for making sure that that victory really is a success. While former Vice President Mike Pence stresses the need for American boots on the ground to show a united front with our allies. We are the leader of the free world. We are uh, Israel's strongest ally on the planet. We need to send a message to Hamas uh, that, that you need to turn those hostages back over or, you, or you'll answer not just to Israeli defense forces, but you'll answer to the United States armed forces. Even as Senator Tim Scott is using the opportunity to go after the president, doubling down on his stance that it's Joe Biden who has blood on his hands for the war breaking out. Weakness from the American president plus the negotiations leading to terrorist attacks by negotiating with the number one state sponsor of terrorism in the world, yes, it creates complicity. The 2024 hopefuls are resolute in their support for Israel and also <laughs> on pro-Palestinian protests erupting on college campuses, many calling to revoke those student visas and deport them. You see students demonstrating in our own country in favor of Hamas terrorists. Some of them are foreigners on student visas. When I'm president, you're making common cause with, uh, with Hamas. I'm canceling your visa, and I am sending you home. Under the Trump administration, we will revoke the student visas of radical anti-American and anti-Semitic foreigners at our colleges and universities. And we will send them straight back home. They go back home. Enjoy your life. It remains to be seen whether these political positions will make or break the primary chances of the 2024 field, but there's no doubt that this war is ushering a new chapter in the Republican race. Our thanks to Selena for that. Still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, the search for a missing man after his wife was found murdered. What police are saying about her marriage and her plans for the future before her death. But next, the battle for Speaker of the House. We take a look at where everything stands by the numbers. With so much
much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Suicide turned into a homicide. Jordan came home and I said goodnight to him, and that's the last time I saw him. They threatened to send these photos to my family. We want money. You need to get it now. And it was constant. It could happen to anybody. And he said, Jordan's gone. And I said, no, no, no. It's nothing that no parents should have to go through. Sextortion. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Reporting outside the Gaza Strip, I'm Matt Gutman. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back, everyone. We have certainly been reporting on all the twists and turns in the speakerless house and the Republicans' effort to vote for a new speaker, which derailed for yet a third time today. Let's take a look at by the numbers at the latest state of play. 21. That's the number of days ago a few House Republicans succeeded in ousting Kevin McCarthy as speaker. This is the longest period the House has been without a speaker since at least 1962. The first candidate to replace McCarthy, Majority Leader Steve Scalise, dropped out on October 12th before a floor vote after it was clear he did not have enough support from Republicans. Representative Jim Jordan, he made it through three failed rounds of voting on the floor before he ultimately decided to hang it up on Friday, October 20th. Majority Whip Tom Emmer is the third Republican to officially try to replace McCarthy, but he lasted only about four hours after he won a closed-door ballot to become the next nominee before also bowing out of the race. 217, that's the amount of votes whoever will become the next speaker will likely need to be become elected. And the one person who at least former President Trump thinks can get to that number, 
Jesus Christ. Trump joked yesterday that no one other than Jesus himself would be able to guarantee the 217 votes needed to get across the finish line. Last week, a member of the House joked behind closed doors that even Jesus couldn't get 217 votes. We will all be watching what comes next. And we still have much more here on Prime tonight. A politician is arrested for having a gun in his carry-on luggage in Hong Kong, how he's now explaining the incident. And what's leading to a beer battle in Boston between the company that owns Samuel Adams and a rival business? It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shot. Mrs. Kennedy's there to stain her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. The common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to the stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot. But Vietnam dominated the news. Help! What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. The search for a missing man wanted for questioning in his wife's death. Body camera video shows the rescue of an abducted woman and the battle brewing between Boston beer companies. These stories and much more in tonight's rundown. Police in Massachusetts are on the lookout for a man wanted for questioning in the death of his wife. Police say he's not considered a suspect at this point. Authorities say Breanne Pennington was found in her home with a gunshot wound to the face after her children alerted the neighbors that they couldn't find their father. Court documents allege their marriage was in trouble and the mother was going to move to Texas with her children. Police say the man is an Air Force veteran with mental health issues and is considered armed and dangerous. 
An Ohio woman was rescued after being held against her will for four days. Body camera video shows Akron police after they broke down a door at the suspect's home. Police say he kept 23-year-old Chloe Jones in his garage and allegedly beat her with his fists and a baseball bat. The suspect, William Mazingo, is charged with kidnapping and felonious assault. A Washington state senator is under arrest, accused of having a gun in carry-on luggage. Washington state senator Jeff Wilson is calling it an honest mistake that he found the pistol in his carry-on bag when he was at the Hong Kong airport and that he told customs authorities the Republican lawmaker was charged with possession of an unregistered firearm. He was arrested and released on Sunday. He posted bail and faces a hearing next week. Wilson was traveling with his wife on vacation to Southeast Asia. Wilson saying he didn't realize he had the gun in his briefcase when he went through airport security in Portland, Oregon, and the TSA screeners did not catch the gun. The moon may be older than we thought. A new analysis of lunar rock brought home by Apollo 17 in 1972 suggests the moon is 40 million years older than previously estimated. That puts its age at about 4.46 billion years old. Scientists say better accuracy helps understand the evolution of both the moon and Earth. The company that owns Samuel Adams and Angry Orchard is accusing a former employee of corporate espionage. According to a lawsuit, the employee for eight years inserted a USB device into a computer copying confidential files. He then started a new job at a rival cider company, Down East Cider. Boston Beer is asking the court to prohibit the employee from working for Down East Cider for a year, saying the material would allow the cider rival a significant competitive advantage advantage. No details on the exact nature of the stolen materials have been released. A very good boy is helping patients in a Pennsylvania dentist's office. August, the fully trained Golden Doodle sits with patients to relieve the stress of dental procedures. Patients can even request for the periodontic pooch to sit on their laps during a visit. Dr. Rachel Lewin, who runs the practice, says August is irreplaceable. I really can't imagine my life without him. The impact of the Israel-Hamas war continues to be far-reaching, including right here at home. This afternoon, former Maryland Governor Larry Hogan joined GMA3 to discuss why he withdrew his offer to participate in fellowships at Harvard University after dozens of student groups released a statement where they blamed Israel for the terrorist attacks they suffered from on October 7th by Hamas. Here's what he had to say. I do uh, respect the, the the right of the students. Uh, free speech is important, um, but the this was this crossed the line, and they have that right. But I thought the university ought to push back very forcefully and directly about the messages. At NYU, another fallout happened when NYU Law School student. Bar Association President Rena Workman released a statement saying, in part, Israel bears full responsibility for this tremendous loss of life. Rena joins us now. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, you say that you're now on the receiving end of a harassment campaign. Explain what you mean by that. Yeah, so I think that the backlash against me and the consequences that I faced have been well documented. But I think it's important to note that right now we're using this backlash as a big distraction from what's really going on, and that's the genocide happening in Gaza. And I think we should all really be focused on calling for a ceasefire and ending the violence that we're seeing playing out right now. If you were to redo the letter, obviously with the benefit of hindsight, anything you would have done differently? I think I will continue to speak up for Palestinian human rights and use whatever platform I have available to me to call for a ceasefire and you know, end this occupation that's harming the Palestinians. I'm gonna just try one more time. Would you change anything, even the timing of it? Because some people felt it was too soon because your letter came before Israel even launched any kind of retaliation. I think it's important to note that the genocide happening right now did not start on October 7th. It started over 75 years ago. And that was what my message was intended to get across, was that we are seeing violence happening that is part of a much larger uh, structural violence uh, system that is happening in Palestine right now. Do you condemn Hamas's actions on October 7th? I think what I use my platform for and who I condemn was pretty clear by my message, and I think that I will continue to condemn apartheid and military occupation, and that in this moment I'm focused on calling for an end to genocide and calling for an immediate ceasefire. Do you think that in this space that we're in right now, there's room? to have empathy for the Israelis who lost their lives 
who were brutalized, were raped, and also empathy for the Palestinians who are similarly losing their lives. Yeah, I think right now, if you turn on any mainstream channel, you'll see the stories of Israelis on every screen you look to. And so I think for me, I will continue to use my platform to uplift the voices of Palestinians and the struggles they're going through, because right now we have over 5,000 Palestinian lives lost, and they are asking us and begging us to share their stories, and that's what I will continue to do. Do you have empathy for the Israeli victims? I think whether or not my empathy goes to Israelis or to Palestinians, is really not the question here. What the question is, is will we call for an end to this genocide and will we call for a ceasefire? Rena, we thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Thank you. With Congress so narrowly divided, a case over South Carolina's election maps argued before the U.S. Supreme Court earlier this month could have a significant impact on the balance of power. Republicans are accused of illegally bleaching a voting district of 30,000 black voters, but was it purely politics fair and square? Our Devin Dwyer traveled to South Carolina for a closer look at the dispute and what's at stake for a historic community and the country. The shores of Port Royal Sound on Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. If you don't have the people, you don't have the culture. A symbol of freedom and a legacy under threat. We can trace our history back to, to West Africa. Taiwan Scott is an island native and member of the Gullah people. This is where freedom began. I mean, they knew that once they got here, they were safe. And, and, and we should still feel that this is our safe haven. It was here during the Civil War that Taiwan's ancestors won the right to govern themselves and with help from the Union Army, created Mitchellville, the first freedman's town anywhere in America. You and other members of the community have been fighting to protect this and so much else about that culture in this area. And, and sadly, we continue to do that. And how much of the struggle is our politics today? I believe it's all politics. Taiwan says the spirit of Mitchellville, of Gullah having a voice in decisions affecting their community, is in danger of being erased by redistricting, the practice of redrawing election maps every 10 years. So this area here, they used to have a nightclub right here. This is where the blacks came to hang out at. And now it's a resort. Now it's a resort, the Marriott. Fewer black residents in the district mean fewer black voters to influence local politicians. We need to be able to have somebody who can speak up and speak out against what's happening to us. For the few of you that are left. That's left. Yeah. Good. Yes. Decades of development and gentrification on the island have nearly obliterated native black neighborhoods and businesses. The goal is to have something like this mimic throughout our communities. You can have some Gullah food in one of these trucks. Uh, that's the goal. On Hilton Head's south end, sacred Gullah land is now home to luxury homes, hotels, and golf clubs. So you know a lot of these folks. Yes, this is, this is my family. Taiwan's family is buried here, just off the 18th hole. Uncle Louis, Uncle Jesse, oh, that's Uncle Ned. This is my culture, this is my heritage. Big corporations, they're just, just pushing our culture and, and, and pushing our heritage to the side. Taiwan says the state's new election map is making things worse. The way the maps are drawn, um, it's taking our opportunity to elect a representative away from us. And I think it's deliberate of how it was drawn. State Republicans redrew congressional maps after the 2020 census to account for population shifts and to consolidate power. They zeroed in on the first congressional district, which stretches from Hilton Head Island up the coast to Charleston. Political scientist Debose Kapaluk says the aim was to make sure Republicans win. We've had a lot of people moving into the district, young cosmopolitan people uh, living in urban areas, and I think that uh, they were more reliably Democratic voters. And so in order to create a district that's more Republican, you're really going to have to have a, a whiter district. The new district boundaries removed 30,000 black voters in the Charleston area to the nearby 6th Congressional District, home to the state's only Democrat in Congress, James Clyburn. Party leaders say the line drawing is, is pure politics. Um, Charleston is a swing county. It is a red county, but it still has some blue tendencies every now and then. And of the allegations that are being made that Republicans are moving black voters out of the first district, 
I've never heard anything like that. There's no way you can say it wasn't racial. Brenda Murphy, president of the South Carolina NAACP, says the outcome has diluted the black vote. Race and politics are highly correlated here in South Carolina. What makes you so confident that it was race and not politics that went into drawing those lines? Because if you look who's living in what neighborhoods and how it's carved out, it's black people. Lincolnville, South Carolina, 20 miles northwest of Charleston, is considered a prime example. It's a town founded by freed slaves after the Civil War. Its popular park and playing fields and the surrounding historically black neighborhoods were for years a contiguous part of the first congressional district. But now, only the park remains, with the black families living around it carved out. We have people that are living in this community that have similar needs. Uh, as those in Congressional District 1. But you're saying there's a lost opportunity there for these families who've lived there their whole lives mm -hmm. and now have a diminished capacity to choose someone that they want. Exactly. Last year, the NAACP and Taiwan Scott sued state Republicans for violating the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. After an eight-day trial, a three-judge panel ruled that Republican map drawers had illegally sorted voters based predominantly on race. Federal district court unanimously said that uh, state Republicans bleached your district of black voters. I hope that's not the case. Uh, that would be very disappointing, but I don't believe that's the case. Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mace, who represents the 1st District, benefited from the more Republican-friendly map in the last election. They got the district a point and a half mm -hmm. better than it was in 2020. As a member of Congress, I don't get a say uh, on what maps right. are supposed to look like, but I do know you cannot legally draw lines based on race. I don't want anyone to feel in South Carolina that their voices are silent. And you take state Republicans at their word that mm -hmm. they used politics and not race yes, in how they drew this. I do. I, I do wholeheartedly believe that. But the Supreme Court at the end of the day will be the ultimate arbiter on what the district looks like next year. The outcome in the case could affect the battle for control of a narrowly divided Congress. But for Taiwan Scott, when it starts affecting a certain group of people, the case is about so much more. It's about race. What does justice look like in this case for you? Justice is an even playing field. One person, one vote. We need to focus on the impact on what's happening to this significant community. How confident are you that this Supreme Court will deliver that? I'm, I'm very confident. I am. Enough is enough. We'll be watching to see how it all plays out. Our thanks to Devin Dwyer for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Lindsay Davis. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Up in the next hour, new developments in the war between Israel and Hamas. What we're learning about negotiations to free more hostages. A protest in Iceland leads some services to close. Even the prime minister joined in. Why women went on a 24-hour strike. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me.
This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Suicide turned into a homicide. Jordan came home and I said goodnight to him, and that's the last time I saw him. They threatened to send these photos to my family. We want money. You need to get it now. And it was constant. It could happen to anybody. And then he said, Jordan's gone. And I said, no, no, no. It's nothing that no parent should have to go through. Sextortion. Impact by Nightline. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin with the Israel-Hamas war and the intense negotiations we've now learned about to free a large number of hostages being held by Hamas. This comes as Israel prepares for a ground invasion of Gaza. But with those roughly 220 hostages at risk, the families of those missing and the U.S. are pressuring Israel to delay any incursion. Thousands of Israeli troops are standing by at the border just waiting for word to go in. And Israel has continued to bombard Gaza in response to Hamas's brutal terror attack. Four hostages have been released so far. Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, leads us off from Tel Aviv. Tonight, ABC News has learned of intense negotiations to free a large number of hostages involving the U.S., Israel, Qatar, and Egypt, head of an expected ground invasion in Gaza. Hamas still holding about 220 hostages, including Americans. Israel facing pressure from the U.S. government and Israeli families to delay any invasion to give negotiators more time. Is there an effort being made to avoid hitting the areas where they might be? Their presence is obviously influencing our operational activities. That pressure intensifying today, 24 hours after these images. Two Israeli seniors released by Hamas, 85-year-old Yohevet Lifshitz and 79-year-old Nurit Cooper, loaded into those ambulances in Egypt, airlifted to Israel. Today, Lifshitz describing living through hell, sitting in her wheelchair, frail, her voice faint. Her daughter Sharon translating, describing the moment Hamas terrorists stormed her kibbutz and kidnapped Lifshitz and her husband. She was taken on the back of a motorbike with her body, uh, with her legs on one side and her head on another side. While she was do being taken, she was hit by uh, sticks. We have reported here on the vast network of tunnels Hamas has built under the Gaza Strip, and Lifshitz describing being taken into those tunnels with the other captives. There are a huge, um, huge um, network of tunnels underneath. It looks like a spider web. The lifelong peace activist who helped Palestinian civilians in the past getting them medical care in Israel, describing how Hamas kidnappers took her jewelry, her watch, but she says they fed her bread, cheese and cucumbers, even gave her medicine, describing the ground as moist, the air humid. Lifshitz also critical of the Israeli government, saying they didn't take warning signs seriously. 
And all day today, Israel launching one of the most intense aerial attacks on Gaza. Over 400 airstrikes in the past 24 hours. Gaza's hospital system on the brink of collapse. The WHO saying an estimated 5,500 pregnant women in Gaza expected to give birth in the next month. But a U.N. agency says emergency delivery kits with step-by-step -step instructions guiding women through their deliveries have yet to arrive, containing plastic bags and scissors to cut the umbilical cord. Officials saying at least six hospitals running out of fuel today, jeopardizing life-saving health care equipment for babies. We've just run out of almost everything. Yesterday, a lot of the times, we had very little electricity. Um, and the killing continues. Just across the border in Israel, we witnessed the IDF's military buildup, mobilizing for that possible ground attack. This is a massive brigade assembly site. You can see armor starting to prepare a maneuver. And just on the other side over there, behind those armored personnel carriers, Israeli troops are preparing for combat. They say they're getting closer and closer to moving into Gaza here. A commander there telling us the fighting expected to be brutal and long. It's one of the most complicated urban area warfare you can think about because you have uh, the above ground, you have uh, Hamas and drones, Hamas have the grenades, and uh, grenades are falling from the sky. So complex. There are thanks to Matt Gutman for that. Now to an ABC News exclusive. In news that former President Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, was granted immunity to testify in the federal election interference case against Trump. Sources familiar with the matter say Meadows has already spoken with special counsel Jack Smith's team at least three times, testifying that he warned Trump there was no evidence to prove election fraud in 2020. Here's ABC's chief Washington correspondent, Jonathan Carl. In a striking break with the former president, Mark Meadows, the former White House chief of staff, long seen as one of Donald Trump's closest and most loyal advisors, has testified before the federal grand jury investigating election interference in exchange for immunity, according to sources familiar with what Meadows has told special counsel Jack Smith's team. Those sources tell ABC News Meadows told prosecutors Trump was being dishonest when he said this on election night in 2020 before all the votes were in. This is a fraud on the American public. This is an embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. But according to sources Meadows told prosecutors, obviously we didn't win. In fact, he said that he agrees with the Department of Homeland Security's assessment that the 2020 election was the most secure election in American history. It's quite an about face for Meadows. He was by Trump's side as he tried to overturn the election, including setting up that phone call where Trump urged Georgia's Secretary of State to, quote, find 11,780 votes. Mr. President, everybody is on the line. And just so this is Mark Meadows, the chief of staff. Meadows was standing backstage with Trump and his family at the January 6th rally outside the White House. Mark Meadows, an actual fighter. <laughs> But sources tell us Meadows testified that in the weeks after the election, he repeatedly told Trump the allegations of significant fraud were turning out to be baseless. There were simply no evidence. Meadows also said he thought of resigning many times himself, those sources say. But he stayed on because he wanted to help ensure a peaceful transition to a Biden administration. This comes on a day of drama and tears in a Georgia courtroom as another close Trump ally pleads guilty in that state's election interference case. State versus uh, Jenna Ellis. Lawyer Jenna Ellis, who promoted Trump's election lies, today says she regrets it all. If I knew then what I know now, I would have declined to represent Donald Trump in these post-election challenges. I look back on this whole experience with deep remorse. Ellis is now pledging to cooperate with prosecutors in their case against Donald Trump. Our thanks to Jonathan Carl. In Iceland, where women went on a 24-hour strike today to fight for gender equality and equal pay. Across the island nation, schools and libraries were closed or operating with shorter hours as staff stayed home. Even the prime minister joined the campaign and did not attend to her official duties. The strike was called to bring attention to the pay gap and gender-based violence. 
And now to the war in Ukraine. Today, President Zelensky said in a video address that his military forces would continue pressure on Russian-occupied Crimea. Zelensky also claimed the illusion of Russia's domination in Crimea and the Black Sea have been shattered. Recently, Ukraine has ramped up strikes on Russian forces in and around Crimea, including the only bridge linking Crimea to Russia. And we still have much more to get to tonight on Prime. Coming up, she's best known as Ginger Spice, but now Jerry Hollowell is embarking on a new venture, how she's taking girl power to a whole new level. But next, talking ex taking exploration to new heights, we go inside a documentary investigating the impact of climate change. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from the White House, I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. A renowned scientist and film crew are taking exploration to new heights in the new documentary, Canary, to investigate the forefront of climate change. Take a look. Lonnie was going where no scientist had gone before. It seemed to be impossible. It's too high for human beings. It's dangerous. There's no way you're going to drill in this remote part of the world. You're wasting your time. Science can only advance when you do things other people think can't be done. ABC's Melissa Don sat down with scientist, professor, and explorer Dr. Lonnie Thompson and MIT-trained neuroscientist, PhD, and filmmaker Alex Rivest to discuss the film. My first encounter with Lonnie it was like I was meeting a real-life Indiana Jones. Thank you for Alex Rivest, yourself actually a trained neuroscientist turned filmmaker for joining us. And then, of course, Dr. Lonnie Thompson, incredible for so much of your research uh, in this field of science and the work that I know that you are still very passionate about. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think it's just so incredible. This uh, documentary that you both have teamed up and worked on uh, has brought a lot of passion and joy, I can clearly see. And Lonnie, I just wanted to start off with you. So much about what you, a lot of your explorations have really taken you all over the world. But this one in specific, this like one glacier that really captivated you. How come? I think because it was so difficult in the beginning to get started because we couldn't get, there wasn't a funding agent that would support research outside of the polar regions for what we wanted to do. And so seeing this ice cap and seeing the possibilities of actually getting a tropical climate record from right above the Amazon basin in the Andes in Peru, 
because we have so many climate variables, El Ninos, monsoons that affect the lives of people, and people don't live in the polar region. They live in the low latitudes where these glaciers are located. So I knew it needed to be done. Lonnie is a visionary. He saw that global climate history captured in these glaciers. And you pushed to go to over 18,000 feet? Yeah, I had no mountaineering experience and no idea what I was getting into. Science can only advance when you do things other people think can't be done. Throughout your expeditions, what is it that you've been looking for? Initially, we were just trying to figure out how tropical glaciers behave relative to polar glaciers, what drives them. But with time and collecting data and mapping the retreat of these glaciers, uh, we became very concerned about the climate and what's driving them. Alex, bringing you in on this conversation, you know the science, you've seen the research. How, as a filmmaker, then, were you so passionate to kind of turn this idea as to we're going to make a science documentary? What really drove you to do this? So I was a neuroscientist. I, I did a PhD at MIT in neuroscience. So when I set out to change the way scientists are seen on the big screen and, and change the way we talk about scientists, I came across Lonnie's story. And on a Skype call with my co-director, Danny O'Malley, uh, Lonnie had us pulled into this adventure story within uh, the first minute, within 40 minutes, we were both crying. And then at the end, I turned to Danny and I said, if there's one story we ever tell in this world, it has to be this one. This glacier started disappearing before Lonnie's eyes. He thought he could change something. If he doesn't do it, nobody would. Lonnie didn't come to climate change. Climate change came to him. If humans can create it, humans can solve it. I don't believe there's anything that we cannot achieve. It was all about telling Lonnie's story. You know, he, he is, there is no one on the planet like Lonnie Thompson. I mean, he has spent four years of his life above 18,000 feet. He's taken over 1,000 people above 18,000 feet and brought back records from 16 countries? 16 countries. 16 countries, glaciers uh, around the tropics that don't exist anymore. It is a story of perseverance and curiosity and it's one of those stories that I think resonates with with audiences because it is it taps into what is possible the beautiful thing is that with something like climate change which can be very daunting there's hope and the hope comes through Lonnie's story Lonnie took what was impossible and made it possible in terms of getting these records from the high mountain glaciers what's also so curious is the name canary of course coming from the expression of a of canary in a coal mine uh, for some, you don't really realize how that expression came about. I'd like to actually ask both of you the inspiration for that name, where it came about, and the meaning of it. In the early days, they would take the canary down to the coal mine, and if the canary died because of lack of oxygen, then the miner knew they had to get out of the mine. The glaciers is that they are our canaries in the coal mine, and they're speaking in one voice, and they're sending a very strong message to all of us that we need to change. I think Canary also applies not just to the glaciers, but the vulnerable communities around the world that are living and depend on these glaciers. They are showing distress. I mean, they are affected by the, the change in water availability from melting glaciers. Speaking with you about that, though, how do you feel? Are you feeling optimistic, pessimistic? What are your thoughts moving forward as we come back? I am an optimist. You don't go to the highest mountains in the world unless you're an optimist. And a uh, climate crisis is the biggest issue that we're going to face in the 21st century. We're just now starting to see it almost every night on the nightly news, these extreme events, and they're occurring all around the world. So all of us are going to be impacted, and only all of us working together can solve this problem. Thank you for that. And for you, Alex, what would your main takeaway be for folks watching this film? I think the, the biggest takeaway for me in this is, you know, this is a science film, but it's a film about belief and the belief in what is possible. Lonnie has seen the best of us come together. He's seen, you know, the results of our denial, you know, in terms of climate change. 
And it's a film about tackling the impossible. We can do this, right? We can tackle the impossible, and we need to find a way to just have a common purpose, that we care about each other, that we care about the planet for our kids, and we can accomplish anything. Fantastic. Well, thank you both so much for joining us. I think, yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Our thanks to Melissa for that. You can watch Canary on select streaming services. And still to come, adventure, magic, and a little bit of spice. Jerry Hollowell from the Spice Girls tells us all about her latest endeavor, a young adult novel. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It all began so beautifully. Suddenly, there was a shot. Mrs. Kennedy said, stain her husband's blood. She said, I want them to see what they have done to Jack. The common data was saying, Lyndon Johnson, now president of the United States. That was when the enormity struck me. I was walking on to a stage for a part I had never rehearsed. I ought to record this. Dr. King's been shot. Senator Kennedy had been shot, but Vietnam dominated the news. What is our country coming to? Are we a sick society? I felt extreme hostility in front of Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy. Was it because I was alive? The greatest courage is to go about the day's work. That's a large order for a woman. <laughs> So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, it's a new venture for an author who is best known as a singer and member of one of the most iconic pop groups of all time. Jerry Hollowell Horner, a.k.a. Ginger Spice of the Spice Girls, is taking the girl power motto into a new realm. Rosie Front and the Falcon Queen is an epic young adult novel that follows a teen who goes to a magical boarding school after the death of her mother. Our Eva Pilgrim sat down with Hollowell Horner about her writing process, the glimpses of herself in the character of Rosie, and the theme of the book, finding the true power that lies within you. Tell us about this book. So the world needs a new hero. And someone ordinary, um, imperfect, and this is a, an adventure about, with some characters in it, the lead the hero, Rosie Frost, and it, she's finding the courage she never knew she had. It's set on Bloodstone Island, um, which is, imagine like a Jurassic Park, uh, but instead of dinosaurs, it's endangered animals. And so Queen Elizabeth I builds this school, and she says, I'm not gonna have any more children. Instead, my heirs will be the pupils, their ideas. Rosie Frost, 500 years later, gets sent to the school when her mother dies. And it's full of, like, treachery. There's the Falcon Queen games, which is a bit like Squid Game, not quite as violent. <laughs> um, full of friendship. It's about finding your power. You, you mentioned sort of the history of it, because mm. Anne, Anne Boleyn mm -hmm. is in there. Yes. <laughs> what, what made you decide to put her in the well, book? Well, I love history. I love the Tudors. 
And so it is set in the modern day times, but this school is steeped in history. And um, so I thought, okay, theme the school, Queen Elizabeth I, but actually perhaps Anne Boleyn, her mother, needs redemption because the history of her is, you know, horrible things were written about her, but I asked myself, who wrote that about her and is it true? And perhaps it was time for her to have redemption. So let's celebrate her. So, and she's the ghost queen in it, basically, that comes to Rosie. And she gives her the rule book that she gave to her own daughter with four rules in it. Very interesting rules that Queen Elizabeth I followed and became the greatest monarch of her time. And these four rules that could apply to your own life or mine. What are those rules? Well, if anyone feels marginalized or just wants to find their power, these four rules are pretty useful. So the first one is, and they're simple rules, the first one is have courage. Take us the chance you fear the most. Number two is united we stand, divided we fall. I need you and you need me. Together we can do, get something over the line. Third one is never give up. So that means basically that tenacity of, you know, keep going, but why am I going to keep going? Because I want to be of service to you, to anyone that picks up that, that book. That, that's what can drive me. I can use that rule. And the, the fourth rule, which I think is the most important rule, and it's Shakespeare, who also went to this school, because amazing people went. Um, it's to thine own self be true. If you like it not these rules, make up your own. <laughs> Perfect, right? Just be yeah. in your own lane, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> if you look at Rosie and she has red hair, Yeah, is, is Rosie in some way a little bit of you as well? When you write, you can't help but put a bit of yourself in there, just a little bit or a point of view, certain, you know, certain characteristics, a little bit. And they always say, write about what you know. Um, and so there are sort of some childhood experience that she has, like she, experienced grief. I lost a parent, so did so does she. What made you want to write a book? I think, I mean, I've always loved writing. Um, I was studying English literature before I went into music. So it's always been a passion of mine. And I love reading as well. And I think when you write, it's a, the secret you discover is that you get to beat, you get to decide what happens, you get to play God. You know, who lives, who dies, who loves, who cries. It's a really powerful thing. And let's face it, sometimes we don't have that much power in our own lives, you know, externally. So it's quite, I quite enjoy that process. <laughs> what do you hope that people take away when they read the book? I, I, I hope in, in different ways, you know, their soul feels lifted up, but then they feel, they feel enriched and empowered and they're smiling. Oh, but there's also a surprise in the book for people. Oh yeah, totally. Oh yes, <laughs> oh yes, yes, yes. I'll tell you what I did. I put music in the, the book. I thought, okay, I'm gonna do a little gift for you and there's two songs in there. So you just scan it and you can hear the songs. They're quite crunchy. One's quite like forceful and, and it's got a rap in it and the other one's like a, meaningful ballad that's... But they help you with the narrative. That's very cool. I and mean, yeah, I'm sure, because people love... You're so loved, and I think because of the Spice Girls, so many, I mean, musicians, you think about like Adele, Beyonce, they've all shouted you guys out for what you did. You were so far ahead of your time. Do you know, I think if you're, if you're a creative person at any point, all, you, all you're doing is you're like, you're a voice for the voiceless. You're giving words that other people can't find themselves, but you're just listen. It's, like, it's about being a good listener. Can I feel what you're feeling, and then just put that into a, you know, into a song or a story? And that's what I think. Rosie Frost, she, she is speaking how the world feels now, how you feel now. A little bit. Sometimes we feel a bit fractured. You know, we're not as strong as we think we are. Um, those pressures about what's going on in the world. So many people have an idea of what you're like, and I think it's, it will surprise them that you wrote this book and were so involved. Like, the whole concept of it is yours. I think writing a book is probably the most intense experience because it is completely immersive, absorbing. It takes, 
like a lot of energy and I didn't realize that until I embarked on it and I couldn't stop and when you're in the middle of it you know and there's other things pulling you out life that's, it's quite hard to, to do that balance but I just I felt compelled do you know what? I felt compelled as you know as well as a creative but I felt you know for anybody that felt disempowered or marginalized or just want to connect that always drives me on that's really that's what keeps me going and also incorporating her musical roots as well. I thanks to Eva for that. You can buy Rosie Frost and the Falcon Queen wherever books are sold. And that is our show for tonight. I'm Lindsay Davis. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. Have a great night. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families time. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye.